Hi everyone, and welcome to my talk on designing for intuitive player experience using the three C's, character, camera, and controls. So before we dive into the main topics, let me introduce myself. I'm Ben, I'm a senior game designer at Creative Assembly. Uh, some of the games that I've worked on in the past include Hyenas, which is the game I'm currently working on with Creative Assembly. It's been recently announced. Um, I've worked on the Crisis franchise and the game called Han Showdown with Crytek. Um, outside of work, um, to be honest, I mostly play games when I have the free time. Um, I read anything Brandon Sanderson and I am walking the dog when I can. Let's talk about the agenda for today's talk. First, I will have a bit of an intro. What is this talk about? Then I will dive into character and the key points uh, for your character design. Then I will talk about camera and how to get the most out of your camera design. I will touch on controls and creating satisfying and reactive controls. And I'll have a few important practicalities at the end, talking about bringing the three C's together and talking about accessibility as well. So what is the goal of this talk? We all know that creating enjoyable player experience is not easy and creating intuitive player experience is even more difficult. But understanding the role of the basic building blocks um, in this process is crucial um, for succeeding in creating both of those things. Um, so this talk's goal is to discuss uh, some of the things, not everything, that goes into designing your three C's, your character, your camera and controls, and how these can improve your game design process and improve your game overall. So the talk is called Designing for Intuitive Player Experience, but what does this mean? So what is designing for a video game? So it's about creating the rule set of the world and all the characters and objects that are in it. Um, it is primarily about defining how the player perceives and interacts with the game. What is um, intuitive? So intuitive is, according to Urban Dictionary, is able to know or understand something because of feelings rather than facts or proof. In computing, it can be simply just said that it is easy to, easy to use and understand. And what is player experience? So player experience is basically the result of game design, implementation, and art exposed to the player. It is a collection of impressions, feelings, and sometimes rationalization of facts as well. So when we are talking about uh, designing for intuitive player experience, we want the player experience to be positive ideally amazing but this is of course very difficult to achieve and it's a, in terms of intuitive we need this for at least the basics we need at least your three c's um, to be intuitive and when you're designing it's not enough to know what are we doing but the most important question is always why are we doing certain things and with that why are three c's important uh, for intuitive player experience so they define how the player perceives, interacts, and expresses themselves in your game world. Um, they play a crucial role in how the player changes the world and how the world can change the player or impact the player. Um, and they are the primary vessels for translating player inputs into actions in the game. So before I go into the main topics, I have some caveats for this talk. Um, so there will be many topics that are not covered in this talk due to time limitation. And it is important to mention convention, affordances, and matching player expectation as some of the core base building blocks for the three Cs and many other parts of your game. But these could have their own talk, really. So um, there's a lot of information about these on the internet. Um, and in books and all of that. Uh, so I'll not be talking about these, but it's important to always keep them in mind. And design methodology, especially validation, holistic design, and all of that is crucial to success. Even if you have your theses kind of nailed down, but you don't have the right design methodology to get there, this is going to cause problems. If you can't validate them well, this is going to be uh, difficult for you to understand whether you're on the right track or not. Design methodology and validation is not part of this uh, this talk because of simply the scope of it. With that out of the way, let's talk about character. So what is the character? The character is the player's representation in the game. It is what the player controls by playing. It's pretty simple, right? It can be a human, it can be a goat, it can be a truck, you know, it can be a building or 
a collection of soldiers, basically whatever you can imagine, it can be a character. Okay, so how to approach designing your character? My number one tip is that you define your fantasy. What is the fantasy you want to convey to your game? If you understand that, this will play a big role in your character design. So how to use your fantasy well? Um, well, first you need to understand why is your fantasy desirable? What are the sort of emotions and desires that it provokes? And then once you know why your fantasy is desirable, whether that's a certain power fantasy or whether that's a sort of simulation or any other kind of fantasy, then you need to design for the strengths of that given fantasy. Because games are about having fun, but what fun looks like will vary dramatically from game to game. For example, if you have a fantasy of racing cars to the streets of a city, you probably want to focus on driving and not focus on filling your gas tank up uh, at a fuel station. And you need to find what about your fantasy makes for fun character design. This is very important. You want to you want to design into the strengths of that given fantasy. But with that, don't let your uh, fantasy actually limit your design. And I will give you an example on, on the game we are currently working on, Hyenas. We have zero G, zero gravity in the game. And historically, and when you think about zero gravity, it's this you know, slow pace sort of methodical movement sort of floating through space. But it doesn't have to be that. In Hyenas, we made zero G movement to be this fast pace or fun action. It still plays into what you know. What is the fantasy of flying through space in zero G? But it's no longer that sort of limited, cumbersome movement. So think outside the box if you feel that your fantasy is too limiting. So let's look at some examples here. Uh, Alien Isolation. It's a it's the fantasy of survival horror. You know, in an atmosphere of constant dread and mortal danger. In American Truck Simulator, is the fantasy of being a truck driver and you know later on a company owner, driving heavy loads through real life landscapes, and then in Warframe, it's sort of this power fantasy of controlling highly powerful combat suits and basically annihilating everything in front of you with overwhelming power and weapons. But all all of these examples, most things the character can do, the way it responds to player input, is. They, they all heavily reinforce the fantasy of the game and the fantasy of the characters. So to recap, your character should reinforce the fun parts of your fantasy. And in order to succeed with your character design, you must first understand why your fantasy is desirable and apply this throughout your design. My tip number two is to design your basic character first. Most games will have either special, special abilities, items, upgrades, or variations of your character. But it's very important to first have a strong grasp of what your very basic character can do. So what is this about? It generally boils down to three key questions. How does your character interact with the world? Um, so this can be everything from movement modes to combat, to peaceful interactions, to collisions, and a lot more. How does your character respond to player input? Basically, it describes what effect does the player input have on the player's representation in the game. And it's very important on this point that the player expectations are met with an appropriate and consistent character action in the game world. And the third point is, what are your character's core attributes? Um, you know, whether that's health, mana, or stamina, those are the sort of your basic fantasy action game uh, attributes. Uh, you know, it can be a lot more than this. It can be stats like damage, defense, um, whatever you can come up with. But you need to define what your basic character can have as attributes. Um, it's also very important to mention here that it's never about specific values. You know, values will change as you iterate on the game. Um, but it's more about the definition of the values that creates the basic character. Maybe you will have a game where your basic character never actually exists for the player. It's just something that you build upon because you have a basic character, but you have classes on top. Uh, it's still important that you create that character first. So let's look at an example with Rocket League. So let's look at the character integration in the world. It's a very streamlined character, and this is an extremely streamlined world. The character is a car yeah, that can drive on any surface, including walls and ceilings, and you know can fly between these surfaces as well, which is um, which is very cool. But level design, most importantly, supports this fantasy. You know, 
the levels are basically big arenas that have, you know, the four walls and the ceiling and the ground, and that's it. And then you can use the space in between them to fly, which is very cool. And then the cars can hit the ball and apply momentum to it, but the cars can also hit other cars and destroy them. It's all based on speed and angle of impact and, and all, all that kind of things. Um, but your character is integrated in the world in a way that it can interact with everything that's in it. So you can say that um, you can destroy other cars there. And um, character physics supports this fantasy as well. So it's sort of kind of made up physics. Um, so when you look at the integration of Rocket League's character in the world, it's pretty good um, in terms of the approach streamlined and the world is built around what the character can do in it. So let's look at the response to player input in Rocket League. So the response is pretty snappy in most cases and of course immediately noticeable. Um, and there is a set of basic input to action mappings that everyone can easily understand. So when you're driving on a surface, you know that when you press left, you go left. Uh, it's pretty basic. But then these sets of inputs have an added mastery uh, once the car starts to leave the ground. So your character starts to do more things uh, based on player input, which is very neat. So when you start flying, maybe when you're holding to the left and then you press another button, um, instead of turning left, you flip to the left or you will roll to the left. There can be different outcomes of that. Um, and the feeling of responsiveness can be illustrated on a scale. So it's a scale from absolute simulation to the most arcade thing you can think of. So if you play some competitors or slightly related games, um, American Truck Sim is more on the simulation side of, of this, um, this scale, and Rocket League would be you know, heavily tilted towards arcade. I think it is a very good practice uh, to have these sort of scales for your game, for your character, for your controls, whatever it might be, um, when you're trying to design them, and then you can plop in some uh, competitors or similar games on the scale, and then you can see how you compare to them. It's a very good, very good exercise. So, then the third bit is core character attributes in Rocket League. So in line with the rest of the character design, this is very nicely streamlined. So the number one attribute you have is the capacity to hold and use the boost. Um, so you can pick up boost on the map and then you can charge it up to 100 and then you can use it. It's a simple sort of attribute similar to something like mana would be in a, in a fantasy game. And then the second attribute is the collision shape of your cars. So different cars have different collision shapes. The impact of this is probably less than the impact of the boost, but it depends on the level of skill you're playing at. So as you can see, they don't have a lot of core character attributes, but the ones they have, they use them very well and they are defined on the basic character and then modified for each uh, sort of class on top of that. So to recap, your basic character should be the foundation of your game. Take your time to define it and don't rush to do the cool stuff. And this will result in a well thought out character design and players will be able to more intuitively understand what your characters can do. Okay, let's move on to metrics. My tip number three, metrics and more metrics. This is basically how fast, how high, how long and the likes of that. So how to design with uh, metrics. Um, so first you need to understand how to leverage metrics. Why are they useful? The number one thing they do is they provide predictability to your players. And I will touch on this uh, a little bit later. Um, so your character movement and in-game presence need to be described with metrics. Can you mathematically describe the movement of your character? If you can, then you are in, in a very good spot. Um, it's important to also note that your character metrics are only ever going to be as good as your level design metrics. It's very important that you allow for your world, for the game world, to be built based on your character. And one of those um, one of those bases will be your character metrics. So even if you have the best metrics in the world, but your level design doesn't match them, you will not have a good game. You will not have an intuitive game. But if you bring the two together, that will be very powerful. Um, so let's talk about what are good and clear metrics. So good metrics should support the fantasy and the core pillars of your game. To give you an example, if you have a superhero game and you want to have your character jump, you probably want to make a jump that's pretty 
unrealistically high and far right because you want to reinforce that you're a superhero. Um, and then clear metrics are where players can read what the character can do at a glance. And that ties to the next point. Um, it actually matters more to have the right type of metrics than the values you use. Same as for attributes, it's not really about what is the sort of number associated with that metric. Um, because you will iterate on this, this will change, um, you know, before release or even after release. But what matters is that you have the metric defined and then you can change the value at any time in the future. Describing your character with metrics will give you a very strong sort of internalized understanding of what you are doing with your character and why. Um, you will see as, as long as uh, you go through the process of you have your character and you sort of metrify that character, um, you'll see the difference of your own understanding of your design before you metrify it and after. It will be, it will be a big difference, trust me. Um, and players will understand metrics quickly and they will also expect them to be sort of well-defined and consistent for an intuitive uh, game experience. Okay, and let's talk about point number four, which is design systems first and features second. So by focusing on systems first, You'll create an environment where your character will be better defined and iteration on your character will be significantly faster down the road. But let's talk about features and systems and what are they. So a feature is sort of a self-contained, usually player-facing part of the game. That can be, as an example, a special ability. And systems are, they are more of an architecture that can be described by parameters, inputs and outputs, and the correlation between those parameters, inputs and outputs. An example is an interaction system. So what are they good for? What, what are the use cases for either of these? Um, so features are usually used for creating things with limited interconnectivity and limited scope. Um, features are often used for, if you need to create something really quickly, you don't have time to create a system, you just create a quick feature. And features are, they can be sort of um, an ideation they can be a sort of jumping board for systems. So when you think about what your game needs in terms of features, and then you pull out a little bit and look at what the features you have or you thought you might need, this could inform what the systems you want to create for your game. And in terms of systems, they are good for creating the correct architecture of your game. Um, they usually provide game-wide solutions to similar problems in your game, for example, uh, interacting with objects in the world. They are scalable and they have, uh, generally speaking, much quicker iteration time. And they provide a sort of easier definition and implementation of otherwise rather complicated interactions in the game. When you hear the buzzword is about systemic interactions, uh, what they actually mean when they say that is that it's not just a bunch of features put together and it's sort of the wild west, but they have uh, in any given game, they have different systems that have defined interactions with one another, and this consistency will carry throughout the game. So to give you an example of these, let's go through a sort of design exercise. So you have a character and you want to give it health. So you could, you know, simply create a health feature. It's a self-contained sort of small thing, but then you start developing your game and now you have spellcasting in the game. So you want to add another feature a mana pool so you just add another feature to the game and then down the road you you know you think that um you might want to limit physical activity in the game as well so you add another um another feature which is your stamina bar okay it's three different features uh, that you now created but there are more complications in the way so all of the above will likely need to be um at least decreased and decreased by player actions or interactions with the world. So you probably want to be able to lose mana, health and stamina, otherwise there is no point of having them. And you probably want to recharge them in a way as well. So later down the road, um, you want to go one step further and you want to segment your mana and health chunks into segments of 25. Um, in this case, you can allow your health to regenerate if it's within a given segment and that, that's you know, a design choice that you've made. So what you have now is three different features. You are duplicating a lot of work with segmenting and being able to decrease and increase these things. Um, and if you start looking at it, it 
seems like it could have been a system instead of just a bunch of individual features. So you can think about health systemically. So what is really health? It is basically just an attribute, right? There can be m many different types of, of character attributes. Health is just one of them that usually goes from zero to 100 or 200 or whatever it might be. So what functionalities do different attributes have? So in this case, health, man, and stamina, they are pretty similar. They can be gained and they can be lost. Um, there can be different methods of gaining and losing them, but that's sort of the main two interactions with them that the player can have. So how do they um, interact with other parts of the game? So of course, things will simply reduce or increase the given attribute. This is something that we can easily generalize and then any object or any interaction can simply reduce or increase a, a given attribute. So what other sort of common things are between these attributes? Um, we talked about segments. Uh, maybe they all need to be segmented or maybe only some of them need to be segmented. They can regen regenerate. Uh, there's a sort of player feedback when you lose health or when you lose um, stamina. Okay, so how do we design a system around this? So number one thing you need to do is define the parameters of your attribute system. What are the sort of minimums? What are the maximums? Uh, what are the default values? You know, what is um, what other parameters um, you can have, like regeneration rate, or um, you know, regeneration amount per second, stuff like that. Um, and then we define the interaction of your system with your game. So it's pretty simple in this case. Um, it can be increased and decreased. Uh, whether that's you know, adding or subtracting or multiplying, you can you can figure that out on, on the way. And then you can parameterize player feedback as well. If you want to add audio feedback or UI feedback or VFX uh, feedback to those interactions, you can parameterize these as well. Um, and then think about what other requirements does your game have for your attribute system. For example, do you ever want to freeze an attribute that it cannot be decreased or increased? That could be, that could be something that you might want to add. And it's important to note that not all attributes must use the entire functionality of your system. So for example, if you have regeneration built into your, uh, built into your system, your health might regenerate, your mana might regenerate, but your stamina never regenerates unless you, uh, you know, use an item or whatever. And in this case, you just set regeneration value to zero and it's a perfectly valid thing to do. Okay, but how does all of this relate to intuitive player experience? So with systems, you can create characters that are understandable and consistent. Players will very quickly pick up on how your systems work. Trust me, they will dig into it and understand it very, very quickly. But then they will expect your character and game to behave in certain ways after that. That's why systems are very powerful compared to features because they provide a sort of consistency throughout the game. Um, and it's important that players don't need to learn every feature individually. Encountering a system only once will provide them with an understanding of what is to come later down uh, in the game. So when you start out the game and you have, uh, just go with the example we had, it's very simple. You have health and uh, stamina. And players un sort of understand what your attribute system is like. And then, you know, three hours into the game, you introduce mana. They will immediately know it can be decreased, increased, it has segments, you can regenerate all of that stuff. They will just pick it up intuitively. Okay, so to recap um, character design and the four points I've talked about. Uh, so point number one is that you define your fantasy. Point number two is that you design your basic character first. You use metrics to sort of describe your character and then design with systems first. If you follow these four steps and some of the other basics like affordance and convention and all of that, this should give you a solid understanding of how you can make your character design feel intuitive in your game world. Okay, our next big topic is uh, camera. So what is the camera? It is what allows the player to perceive the game world. You know, cameras come in all forms, um, but the primary purpose is to be a viewpoint for the player into your game world. Um, so how to approach designing your camera? So point number one is match the camera to the fantasy. You know, unleash the potential of your camera to deliver on your fantasy. Let's talk about this a little bit. The first thing you need to do is understand the feelings you want to invoke in your game. And I'll give you some examples here. 
do you want the player to care about the character they're playing? You probably want to go third person or over the shoulder view. Do you want the player to feel tense and claustrophobic? First person view might be the thing you go for. Or do you want the player to feel more in control, more tactical, more strategic? Then you probably want to pull out and go like a top-down view. Um, all of this will start with your camera. So it's important that you start with the basics. The more the player can see from the level at any given time, the more in control they will feel. You know, control over the camera can be directly correlated with how tense the player feels. If you have a first-person game and you suddenly uh, freeze camera movement, that will make it pretty tense for the player. Um, things near the center of the camera are much more likely to be focused on by the player. You know, decoupling the camera from the character movement can provide a sense of safety. For example, in third-person shooters, when you go, when you want to peek around the corner, you don't actually have to put your character at risk. And changing perspective or zoom level can be a very powerful uh, tool when used with clear intent um, in the game. And there's a lot more of the basics, but these are just some of the things that you might want to apply to your game uh, immediately. Um, it's important to do not be afraid to adapt your camera. You know, games are complicated. Uh, and sometimes they are long journeys and you might want to convey a, a whole range of different feelings and ideas and fantasies. So don't let your camera get in the way of telling your story and your game. So to recap, use your camera to help players immerse themselves into the fantasy of your game. And this will directly help them uh, understanding your game better and quicker. So tip number two, adapt your camera to show what is important. So games are interactive and presenting the players with the right information at the right time is key for this interactivity. So first you need to understand and define what is important. Different games, different levels within your games will have different definitions for this. Um, you need to know what you expect the player to do and understand the sort of desired player behavior uh, when you try to adapt your camera. And cameras are always expected to be intuitive. If you think about real world, uh, your cameras are your eyes for most of us and you expect your eyes um, to work intuitively you don't think about where you're going to look what you're going to see you just sort of expect it to work and this is not any different uh, in a game either the expectation is that the player um, can easily access the information to their camera that they want at any given point should your camera adapt automatically I'll give you a sort of guideline for this. Um, so if your camera handling is part of the challenge, give the players the tools to manipulate the camera, but don't make it adapt automatically. However, if the camera handling is not part of your challenge and it will just get in the way of gameplay, or you just want to convey information, they just adapt your camera automatically. I'll give you an example of the camera's effect on player behavior. Let's say you have um, a road that splits into two smaller paths and you have a player going down that road. If you automatically adapt your camera so that the player, when the player is walking down that road before the sort of split, uh, you move the camera to the left, the player will be more likely to go left than to go right because the camera strongly suggests that you should go in the direction of the left. If you have the same situation, a player is going down the path and then it splits into two, but then you automatically pan the camera to the right path, then the player will be much more likely to go to the right than to the left, because the camera suggests that the player should go to the right. But if you have the same situation, the player is going down the road, but you don't actually move the camera in any meaningful way, then this will be a player choice. It's still not an unbiased choice, of course. The player will make choices based on what the environment looks like, whether they are right-handed or left-handed, and there's a lot more that goes into it. But your camera will not be affecting the player behavior directly. So to recap, adapting your camera will help making sure it does not get in the way of gameplay. And you can influence your player's choices and have decision-making. And oftentimes you can do this without the players even noticing what happened to them. Let's talk about my tip number three, which is um, use camera as gameplay feedback. Um, you know, have you ever had blurry vision when you were really tired? It's probably your body was telling you it's time to uh, time to shut your eyes and go to sleep. Why is camera a great resource for feedback? Well, it's always there. You know, from the moment your game is booted up until the moment your game is closed, there will be a camera presenting something to the player, even if it's just a black screen or a loading screen. Changing the behaviors of your camera has a wide range of possible outcomes. Small feedbacks like camera shake 
can you know have a minor impact on player behavior like if you take damage you have a minor camera shake that may or may not have the player to make choices but bigger things like changing your perspective entirely going from first person to third person has a much stronger impact on on, on the behavior of the players and how and where you present the information will greatly impact how it is perceived by the player you know the player can see stuff in the world in 3d they can see it in 2d on the hud uh, through the camera and where it's positioned whether it's in the center or, or around the edges will have a great impact on how it's perceived by the player so some of the um, common camera feedback methods uh, you have camera shake you know it communicates the impact of something affecting the character or the world near the character for example being shot in a first person shooter then you have changing the field of view um, it usually communicates speed but it can be more versatile than that but it's it's an example of when in a racing game you suddenly go really fast your fov usually changes or you sprint in a uh, in an action game changing the color scheme so this can have a very wide range of impact but usually used to communicate that the player has entered a different state a good example for this is in hunt showdown we have the dark side when the verse sort of goes uh, black and white and you see things differently so there's the adding the overlay thing so it usually communicates that something has happened to the player either a positive or a negative thing. So a positive example could be that you're being healed and you have some healing overlay on your screen or that you've been flashbanged and now you only see a white overlay on your screen. And then there is, of course, changing perspective, one of the most powerful ones. Um, this has a wide range of possibilities, but it usually communicates a big state change. So for example, in a first person shooter, you get downed by an enemy player and then the camera goes from first person to third person to show your character sort of suffering on the ground it's it's a, you know it's a huge state change in both the character and and the game you're playing and there's a lot more of these uh, these are just some of the more common elements but just make sure you explore and find your own way uh, to use camera as feedback and uh, to recap using your camera as gameplay feedback will give you a lot of bang for buck because it's always reliably there um and then Generally speaking, the more existing stuff that you can use for feedback, the less new things the player needs to learn, and this will lead to a more intuitive gameplay experience. So for camera design, um, the three points we touched on is match it to your fantasy, adapt and show what is important, and use your camera as feedback. And if you combine these three with some of the other basics, this will give you a good understanding of how to build up your camera to, to lead to good intuitive player experience. And that brings us to our final uh, point of the three Cs, controls. What is the controls? It describes how the player can interact with the game with uh, input. And there are many different types of input devices from mouse and keyboard to touch screen to gamepad. But the purpose of all of them is to translate player's input into in-game action. So how to approach designing your controls? So number one thing that is very important to understand is what is friction and what is challenge basically where does frustration end and fun begin what are these in relation of controls friction is basically an unintended difficulty or unclear responsiveness the players experience when they try to perform an action while the challenge is an action or a set of actions that requires a specific timing or a specific combination of player input challenges often have a structure of requirement and reward after that so those two sound pretty similar, but let's uh, break them a bit more uh, down to see why they are quite different. Friction often does not have a clear reward or a good balance between a reward and requirement, while challenges are designed with a reward mindset. Friction's primary emotion, the primary emotion it generates, is frustration, while challenges should generate interest for requirement and joy for the reward. And friction is where player expectation and control requirements don't match. Um, while challenges build on player expectation but inject a skill check into them they are something the players is required to learn and they are something that they can also master over time so a good example for friction is that you're playing a, a fantasy action game you connect with a bow in your left hand and a sword in your right hand but you cannot use them at the same time and to use one you have to unequip the other so what is the source of friction here it's basically your system is not able to handle a key combination of weapons without additional complexity and when the player equips a bow they want to shoot arrows when they equip a sword they want to hit things with the sword but the two actions are incompatible yet offered at the same time or seemingly offered at the same time uh, to the player 
So there are ways to fix this, and there are many solutions. I would just suggest uh, two of them here, but you need to figure out what is the best solution for your specific game, of course. So one solution could be that simply make the bow two-handed weapon. So a bow cannot equip uh, at the same time as a sword. Uh, done. You resolved uh, the conflict. Um, or offer two different inputs to firing a bow and swinging a sword. Maybe you press left mouse click to hit with the sword and right mouse click to shoot with the bow. There can, of course, be other solutions, but those those would uh, eliminate the friction and the frustration from the game. So a challenge example, let's look at bullet jump in Warframe. Um, so why is this such a great control challenge? Well, this is very clear, you know, the reward is going very fast, which in a game where you try to grind a lot of things is very important. The requirements are also clear as you simply preserve momentum while chaining actions. The player input is consistent and consistently easy to pull off. The challenge is the timing and how you chain these inputs together. And it's easy to learn the basics, you know, uh, just crouching and pressing space will put you in a bullet jump. That's pretty easy to learn. But then there's quite a bit of room to improve. You can add additional actions. You can add the roll at the end of your bullet jump or a flip or whatever. And then the way you land, you can chain another bullet jump into that or you aim at the wall, you know, there's there's a lot more stuff that you can use to master over time um, and grow from the basics. So this leads us to the dreaded sentence, easy to learn, hard to master. So what does it mean, to, uh, easy to learn, hard to master in, in, in relation to friction and challenge? So easy to learn is basically the less friction you have in your controls, the easier and more intuitive it will be to learn them. And hard to master is when you have challenges that are rewarding to learn, and have high skill ceilings built into them, um, you will create a control scheme that will be hard to master. So reduce friction, increase challenges and skill ceiling will result in easy to learn, hard to master game. So am I saying that if you don't have any friction in your controls, you have a good game? Um, well, friction is a complex topic and probably it could use its own, you know, 45 minute talk. Um, but here are some, um, some guidelines that you can follow for intuitive controls. Um, so design for clear and consistent input and action combinations. Um, use these with added complexity or timing to create rewarding challenges. And identify and iterate out negative friction that causes frustration. That will, um, that will um, help you resolve your issue with friction and help you create uh, more rewarding challenges. So point number two, design to make your worst case scenario work. To make sure your controls shine consistently, make them work in your worst case scenario. This is very important. So how to approach designing for it? Well, first you need to understand what is your worst case scenario in your game? What does it look like? Then you need to recreate a situation where your controls might not work and start to iterate on them until you feel confident that it's satisfactory for you. Once you have a solution that feels good, you need to validate this with playtest, UX test and, and all of that. It's important that your game will evolve, so don't let your controls lag behind. If your game goes through significant iterations, your controls need to adapt and they need to be brought up to speed as well. So let's, let me give you an example. You're making a helicopter combat game because it's cool. So you create a control scheme that requires you know, complicated inputs to do fly maneuvers. You test it in levels with open skies. It plays really well. It has a nice heavy feeling to it. But then you know that you'll make you'll need to make maps that are a lot more interesting than just uh, wide open skies. So you add levels where players fight between skyscrapers because that feels very good. However, suddenly your heavy control scheme is not suited for the environment anymore. And when players try to maneuver between skyscrapers, they crash into them often, and this leads to player frustration. So you now need to take a step back and revisit your control scheme in your worst case scenario, which is uh, flying through um, busy skyscraper uh, landscape. And you always need to think about your target platform. So I'll, there are more platforms that I would simplify to mobile consoles and PC. Um, you always need to design for the platform first that has the most limitations on input. This will usually be mobile or consoles. Um, so once you have your input and controls on the platform with most limitations, make sure you port the control scheme downwards in an appropriate way. Don't just copy it, make sure you port it in, 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 in an appropriate way. Do not just assume that it will work on a one-on-one -on -one conversion uh, uh, very well. Um, and use your worst case scenarios to compare platform controls. This will give you a good idea whether your port worked well or not. So to recap, 
you can make your controls hold up in if you can make them hold up in worst case scenarios you will have a reasonable chance of creating something intuitive and the more consistently you can match player expectation with your control scheme the more likely the players will stick around and they will continue playing your game and that brings us to point number three responsiveness um, players will always expect a response to an input even if that input cannot result in the action they would like to perform so what does it mean to have responsive controls it means that each player has an adequate and quick player facing reaction from the game so you have an input you have a reaction very shortly after that the reaction can of course be both positive and negative so positive reactions are where the player wants to perform an action with an input and the game reacts by simply performing that action um, and a negative reaction is where the player wants to perform an action but that action is not available at the given time both positive and negative reactions need to be instantaneous this doesn't mean that the action needs to be instantaneous what this means is that something needs to happen immediately after the input so the player understands that they've done something and there is an appropriate reaction to that so let's talk about an example for positive reaction so in a first person shooter the player pulls the trigger to fire the weapon positive reaction the weapon fires and then bullets spray out leaving tracers and sound and recoil all of that and creating a strong feedback to the player action on the other hand negative reaction is that same situation the player pulls the trigger to fire the weapon but the magazine is empty and the player has no more ammo so cannot fire the gun so there can be some examples for negative feedback here you know a clicking sound from the gun indicating that it cannot fire anymore or an animation that the player takes out the empty mag and shows it to the camera or simply the player just switches to a, a secondary weapon if there is one in the game you need to remember that for responsive controls what matters is that something starts to happen immediately not that the entire reaction is quick so to recap the lack of response often leads to players sort of second guessing whether the input was even registered uh, or is the bug in the game and they should be completely avoided all the time um, and creating responsive controls will make your game feel better and your gameplay mechanics will be more intuitive by teaching the players what they can and cannot do at any given time in terms of control design we talked about friction versus challenge worst case scenario design and responsiveness and if you apply again convention uh, and some of the other basics to this this should give you a good uh, picture of how to approach designing the controls for your game and before we end the talk let's talk about some important practicalities so number one how to bring it all together a game is not simply you know uh, a sum of its parts but the intricacies of interaction between core features and systems play a big role in how much fun it is to play your game so character controls and camera needs to be thought about together not just individually each of them play you know a key role in the core experience and each of them have best design practices associated with them that are unique to them but they should never be treated as standalone parts of the game there will be many aspects that need to consistently inform your design across these three elements for example worst case scenario i mentioned it in controls but it should really be uh, applied to camera and character as well and it's important to acknowledge that changing one of them will have a ripple effect on all of them and what makes for a truly spectacular game is where the three c's are brought together by design prowess and sort of great creative vision so it's not enough to just make them good individually it's more important to bring them together in a way that makes for a very good game. So if you can make your character camera and controls amazing on their own, but if you're unable, if you're unable to bring them together, you know, into a cohesive experience, your game will suffer. So always design your game holistically. And this is especially important for the three C's. And the final point I would like to talk about is accessibility. So never forget about accessibility. What is it? Video game accessibility is considered to be a subfield of computer accessibility which studies how software and computers can be made accessible to users with various types of impairments. This is from Wikipedia. So why is it important? You know, as entrepreneurs, we should drive our products to be enjoyable by as many as possible. And accessibility features are not, you know, they don't only help specific groups of people, but they make your game overall better. So what are some of the things that you should consider with 3Cs and accessibility? You know, this would largely depend on the game you're making, but there is an abundance of resources online uh, that, that you can use to help decide what is the best fit for a game. So gameaccessibilityguidelines.com is a great resource, and I would suggest using it as much as you can. But here are some examples. So 
what are the input devices you support? Um, do you have aids for in place for visual or hearing impaired players? How much of the game experience can be modified by the players to fit their needs? Can some of the actions the players take in the game have alternate settings to allow for wider accessibility? You know, for example, requiring a hold button is not great. Can players just use a toggle instead of holding? All in all, creating a game that is accessible to people with different types of disabilities and impairments will not only allow more players to enjoy your product, but if done well, it will result in an overall better game. And with that, thank you very much for listening.